Good morning everybody. This is Danny from Deep South Homestead. We are, uh, there was a lot of you that I know really wanted to be able to come to the conference, uh, the Great Appalachian um, Homesteading Conference. And after doing a lot of thinking about it, uh, what I've decided to do is to show you the class that I taught, but my class only. I'm not going to show you everything that went on there. I'm going to show you uh, one of my classes. I'm not going to show you both of them because um, one of them was a panel and it had all the uh, all the other guys and, and ladies on it. Um, and I don't feel like it would be right for me to expose them if they didn't want you to, but because y'all are my faithful followers and a lot of you were there, a lot of you will know that we will remember some of this stuff and a lot of you might have said man I, I don't know what he said or I, I, I missed this or I missed that uh, so we're gonna we're gonna recreate this for you um, we had some camera difficulties for the first few minutes so what I'm gonna do is in the first part of this talk here I'm gonna kinda explain what was going on in the beginning and then I'm gonna turn it over and I'm gonna let you watch the entire speech and it's kinda lengthy it can just gonna be about an hour um, but um, those of you didn't get to make the conference for physical reasons, maybe you're, you know, maybe you're in the house and can't get out, or maybe you had family problems, you couldn't make it, job, you couldn't make it, you know, maybe financially just couldn't make it, because y'all are so faithful to us and you're so good to us. Um, I want to share this with you. I want to thank Patera from the Appalachian Homestead uh, for for asking us to come. You know that. Uh, that meant a lot to us that she thought enough of us to come up there and I want to personally thank Patera for, for having us there because there was a lot of really great people there uh, and when I say great there, everyone there was on the same page not only about homesteading and not only about surviving off the land but it seemed like everybody was on the same same page spiritually maybe um, because you could feel the presence of God in this conference meeting you could feel the presence of the Spirit there and if this if this thing didn't accomplish anything other than just the fact that it brought it brought a lot of godly people together then then it was a success it was a huge success now what I'm fixing to show you in the clip here, there was about a thousand people in the room, pretty close to it. So, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a lot of people there, y'all, and it was a, it was a big, uh, just a big like a sea of people. When I was standing there talking, I mean, it was like a hundred and something foot. I mean, I don't know how long the building was; could have been two hundred feet long. But it just there was just people standing all around the edges, uh, standing room only. All the chairs were full. I mean, it was like a, I don't remember. That. We had to bring in like four hundred more chairs. I mean, there was just, besides what was already in there, you know, we were looking at close to a thousand people being there. Um, lots of vets came in. That's the one thing that really impressed me was a lot of veterans that Patera had offered tickets to free uh, came in at the last. I mean, it was just, it was just, it was just amazing. Um, there was people came in from every part of the United States was represented in this conference, and it was just, it was just amazing, y'all. And even people in the military took leave and flew in from as far away as Japan coming into this conference. Now that's how important that it was to some people. But nevertheless, I don't want to bore you with that. In the beginning of the speech here where we had some camera difficulties, um, I had to edit some of that stuff out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you the beginning part of it and then we're going to pick up in the actual speech there. Um, in the beginning part, I talked about how that the sweet potato is actually um, it's not in the tuber family. A lot of people would think that it is, but it's not. It's actually in the morning glory family, uh, and and because of that, it uh, it makes a big beautiful flower when it blooms. It looks just like a morning glory, and, and it's just a, it's just beautiful, you know. And, and we talked about the differences that the sweet potato is not a yam. A yam and a sweet potato are two different plants, totally. The sweet potato, we talked about how that uh, during the world wars that was going on, uh, the historical side of it, some of it, how people actually planted sweet potatoes everywhere just to survive on because of its nutritional value. The sweet potato carries enough nutrition 
the beta carotenes, the vitamin A's, the manganese. I mean, um, it just I could just go on down the list. It carries every vi uh, uh, every nutrient that the body needs to be able to survive. And they knew this during the World Wars, and that's why a lot of people planted them was so that they have a good survival food for their and it was their homesteads back then. Even people who lived in town, you know, planted them. Um, so that they'd be able to survive. But the sad part about it was, is when the World Wars was over, and people, the, the people who still planted sweet potatoes after the World Wars was classified as poor people. Because the, the economy had begun to pick back up, and people just quit growing them, they'd go into stores buying stuff. But those who, um, you know, it was sad, but those who actually still planted sweet potatoes was looked down upon as being poor people. And to this day, there are a lot of elderly people who will not eat sweet potatoes. They will not grow sweet potatoes just simply because of that memory of being called poor for having grown sweet potatoes. Now, I, I moved on from that and I began to talk about how that the sweet potatoes, how that, um, you know, you don't want to plant your big old pretty sweet potatoes, you know, say maybe two and three inches in diameter and just your big beautiful baking potatoes. Those are not the kind of potatoes that you want for slips. Those are the kind of potatoes you put up for eating because it makes no difference when you're growing a slip whether it's a little small potato or whether it's a large potato. As a matter of fact, I look for the slips that are, say, a lot of mine may be three inches long. Some of them may be up to ten inches long, and they may not be no bigger rounder than my thumb, or they might be an inch and a half in diameter. To me, the long, slender ones I've learned makes slips just as good as the old big ones and most people don't fool with the little young, the little small slender ones anyway, and they just pitch them to the side. So I'm thinking to myself, why would I want to use my good baking potatoes, my big pretty ones, for growing slips, when those small ones will grow them just as well? And I do also use some that may not be two and three inches long and are just kind of round. I'll use those also because, and but we do can those, but it just if we have a tremendous amount of them, rather than sit and try to boil them all and get the peelings off of them to can. We will save some of those for putting slips in the ground. Now, I'll put on the average of 10, sometimes maybe 15 of these little long slender potatoes in the ground. And from those, by putting them in the ground, I'll harvest as many as three to 500 slips off of those potatoes. Because when you, what I, the process that I talked about in this particular meeting here was you want to make sure in the field that your ground is broke about 12 inches deep and it's been amended with some good soil or some good composting uh, soil. Now, sweet potatoes does not need a high nitrogen content. They just need a good, a good balanced fertilizer put in the ground because the higher the nitrogen content on the sweet potato plant, the more vine you're going to end up with and the, and the less amount of potatoes you're going to end up with. But when it comes time to growing the slips, that's what was mainly talked about in this first part of this was you want to make you a good hot bed and you want to do this about four weeks before the last frost. Go ahead and get it done. Go ahead and get you, uh, dig you some uh, good rich compost into the ground. Uh, you want to dig you a furrow about six inches deep and you want to lay these sweet potatoes down in that furrow and you want to cover them over either with some sand or some sawdust or something like that and then you want to cover the bed with maybe some pine straw or if you've got a if you've got a hot box or a cold frame or whatever that's that's even better because it'll heat the ground up and the sweet potato draws will actually start coming up through those and when the draws are actually sticking above the ground anywhere between four and six inches tall if you'll reach and just grab those sweet potato plants you can pull them loose from the potato in the ground just be careful not to pull the whole potato up out of the ground just break the slips off one by one they'll pull up and the, and the long slip will be hanging there with roots all the way down them and that, my friend, is the correct way to grow a sweet potato slip. Now, not in the jars with the water like I explained to them there. I mean, it can be done that way. But if you want to sit around and spend your days and your time monitoring a sweet potato with toothpicks stuck in it in a jar of water and have that foul-smelling water there in the house and plus having to break the drawers off and put them in water again, it just takes more of your time. If you want to do that, that's perfectly fine. But I choose personally here at Deep South Homestead to go back to the way God intended for it to be done and the way nature does it and just put them in the ground where they grow naturally and once you do that all you got to do is walk by every day and just kind of monitor them 
And in three to four weeks, you should have nice slips standing up there, beautiful and tall. And you don't have all this wondering about whether or not you're going to have any slips with roots on them. Because a lot of times when they grow in the jars, the slips don't even grow roots on them. you got to break them off and put them in another jar of water. And that's just more work on your part. So why not let nature do the work for you and just grow them in the ground? Because that's the proper way to do it. And let me just also mention that when you pull the sweet potato slips off and make sure you do not pull the potato up out of the ground because these things will continue even though you break that sweet potato slip off it will continue to grow more sweet potato slips and you, as a matter of fact you'll just grow them all summer long if you leave them in the ground I mean you, you'll be able to grow enough sweet potato slips for to do Lord knows what with it's like I told you I may only do 10 or 15 potatoes and I can get anywhere between three and 500 slips from it so now if you're interested I also have a sweet potato manual that I sell. Um, and this sweet potato manual has step-by-step -step pictures. It has everything to go along with every step on it. And those will be up on our Etsy store. Um, you'll see that in the description down below. You'll be able to go to that to uh, actually purchase one of these sweet potato manuals if you did not get one at the conference. Now, we sold hundreds of them at the conference, but there may be those who wanted them and did not get them. Thank you for those of you who come to the conference. Uh, it was a blast. Who sat in the room and listened? You know, we had a thousand, probably a thousand people in this class when, it, when we were speaking about it. Uh, was it just extremely encouraging? I tell you the rest of this story in the clip you're fixing to see. Plus, I took questions and answered. I took questions and I answered them from the people. Now, not every one of them was about sweet potatoes, but a lot of them were. So, if you hang around to the end of the video and listen to the different questions that was answered, uh, asked, uh, and I answered them. Uh, maybe it was some of them, some questions that y'all might have had. So um, I'm going to turn this over now and let you watch the um, the video at the conference that was shot. And I hope you enjoy it. And thank you for watching from Deep South Homestead. A year. So what you want to do is when you get these slips up out of the ground, is you want to be able to take a pair of scissors and the first one half inch to the first inch on that slip, you just want to clip it off because that's the part that harbors the virus for the next year's crop. So that way you can ensure that you can grow yourself a virus-free crop if you would do that from year to year. Now, a lot of times, if I don't have time to put my sweet potatoes in the ground right after I pull them up out of the ground, my slips, you can put them in water. You can take a square, like I have a square container here showing, I think. Yeah, you have a square container, I'll take them as soon as I pull them out of the ground, I'll drop them over into this water, and it keeps the it keeps the roots real moist, and they're not going to dry out until you can actually get them in the ground. And you can leave them in that water for up to two weeks, and all they'll do is continue to grow and continue to put on more roots and actually make it a better plant to go in the ground. Now, a lot of people go with, I've got back problems. You're looking at a guy who's broke his back, he's broke his neck, and all this kind of stuff. And I'm not a big fan of bending over, okay? So if you go back and do it the way our forefathers done it, they didn't like to bend over either, even if they had good backs. So what I do at Deep South Homestead is I show a technique, and I, and I, did, I do apologize for going off leaving this stick that I have. It is a forked stick. I just go around through the woods and I hunt me up a forked stick. It's not a very big fork. It's got a small fork on the bottom of it. And what I do is I just walk along, once my rows are made up, I take a pitchfork or a potato digging fork, not a pitchfork, but a pitchfork would work. And I stick it in the ground and I just kind of loosen the ground up if I haven't taken a tractor and already pre-done the ground. And I just drop the slip on the ground right on top of that mound that I have there. And I have this fork of stick that's about this long. And I just take the point of that stick and I put it on the roots right at the bottom of the sweet potato and you just push it in the ground. And you can push it down six, eight inches deep, however deep you want to go with it, or however deep you have your ground broke, that puts that potato down in the ground, that slip, and you have no bending over involved in it whatsoever. It's, it's completely done at that point. All you have to do is come along behind it and literally just take your watering can, you can stand up and walk, and just start pouring water on it. As you walk to the next one, you can pour the water on it. And when you put that water in that hole which you just push that sweet potato slip down in with, what it does is it washes the dirt in around them roots and you make complete contact, you got good soil contact with the roots on the sweet potato slip and therefore nature can take its 
can take off from that point on. Now, if you get the manual that I have here, I go on to talk about in the manual there about in two weeks you can expect uh, what you'll see, in three weeks you can expect what you'll see, you know, and, and on and on and on. And when you finally get up to the point where you see uh, the sweet potato starts putting on blooms, it'll resemble a morning glory bloom that's on it. Uh, uh, an okra bloom, for those of you, I don't know, some people don't know who, what okra is. I mean, I didn't realize Starry didn't know what okra was until last night. I thought that was, that was mind-blowing to me. But uh, actually, Dirk Patchev and Julian didn't know what okra, okra was either. So, um, But once you get it to that point, and it starts putting on blooms, the saying there is, when it's blooming, it's making potatoes. So... Once our field gets completely covered up with sweet potatoes and the vines get to running everywhere, now, this is going to be another thing that you want to keep in mind. It's going to depend on where you live in the United States as to which variety of sweet potatoes you can grow. Because not every sweet potato variety is going to grow anywhere in this country. Because some varieties have a 90-day growing season. Some of them, like the ones we do, has a 120 to 140-day growing season. So the, I'm sitting here in my mind trying to, while I'm talking to y'all, trying to go over the different varieties. Uh, the Beauregard variety is a variety for the northern climates because it has a very small runner vine on it that doesn't take up a lot of the, the, the warmth time that you have to grow the short growing period, growing vines. It puts all of its effort into growing the root of the potato. And they're usually clustered right under the very bottom of it, straight down, and that makes that a very good variety for cool weather climates because of its short growing season. Now like us, we'll do the Vardamans or the Puerto Rican yams, which I don't know why they put yam on the end of that because a yam and a sweet potato is two totally different plants. Um, even though we call them sweet potato yams a lot of times, it's two completely different plants. A yam is actually a very bitter plant growing in South Africa. Um, but um, you know, and once you get to that point, a lot of people go, but what about the weeds in my sweet potatoes? Look, once they get once they get a lot of vines on them and start growing all over the place, you're going to have some weeds. You know, so don't fret about it because it's not hurting the plant. As a matter of fact, the more vine you have on top of the ground, the more, I guess you can say, the more the sun's not going to hit the ground and the less weed growth you're going to have. So in deep south where we live at, we don't do a lot of deep mulching for sweet potatoes and things like that because the more deep mulch we put on the ground we create an environment for rats because when you have rats, rats love sweet potatoes and they will literally clean a field up. Wanda and I had one whole field completely lost last year simply because we tried to go in and we tried to mulch around some of them and we tried to do this stuff and all we did was create an environment for a rat to bed under. And when he, when they figured out, those field rats figured out that those sweet potatoes were there, they just went from plant to plant, down through there. And I mean, they just, they just when we dig the plants, it'd just be holes in the ground where the sweet potato used to be at. Because they cleaned them up. And that's one of the, I mean, a lot of people go, well, these, the sweet potatoes have a lot of different pests that, have to, that you have to contend with. That's going to be our number one where we live in, is field mice. You know, because you're going to lose some to that, and you just have to understand it up front. You've got to plan enough of them that um, you don't have to deal with that. Our number two predator or problem with sweet potatoes is deer. If you have deer, deer love sweet potato tops. You know, they literally love them. And they can come in, two or three deer can come in in one night, and they can mow a whole field of sweet potatoes off. Literally. And a lot of people, like when it comes time to harvest sweet potatoes, and I was guilty of this for quite some time, I, I would go out and I would cut my vines off and I would feed them to my cattle. Because ca cows are like deer, they love sweet potato vines. And I was harvesting them, throwing them over the fence to my cows. We had a, Vietnam, a, a Korean lady who was a friend of ours who was visiting, and she walks out and she goes, No, 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 Mr. Danny, you don't throw, you don't throw this over the fence with the cows. And I'm like, I thought it was an I said, I feed my cows these all the time. And she goes, no, 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 they're edible. And I thought, I said, well, I'm from the South. I don't eat my plants. You know, I eat what comes on. <laughs> and she begged and pleaded with me to let her and her sister go into the field and get all of the, 
the leaves and the stems off of the sweet potatoes. And I agreed to it. And I asked her, I said, what do you do with them? You know? And she said, the leaves we cook up into greens. She said, you eat turnip greens, you eat collards, you eat mustard greens. She said, sweet potato leaves are loaded with nutrition. She said, the Korean people in, in her country, that's what they do. And I said, well, what are you doing with all these little stems that you're cutting off? Because to me, this was just a waste of my time. You know, because I'm sitting here going like, I'm not sitting here on a freaking pair of scissors. And just, you know, I'm not going through a girl snipping off all these little stems. And she, she was sitting there told me, she says, no, no, no. And she says, it's great in stir fry. She said, if you're going to stir fry stuff, she says, instead of getting broccoli and cauliflowers and stuff like that, she says, you've already got one of the most nutritious things you can have right there. So they would stir fry the stems into their food source, which was educational to me. Wanda and I last year actually done a video on eating that such stuff. And it is actually, uh, it's actually pretty good. You know, and I get asked all the time, well, now, how many sweet potato slips do I need to be able to grow enough sweet potatoes for us? And that's going to depend on how many sweet potatoes you eat. Wanda and I set out about 400 slips every year. Last year we harvested, what was it, 250 pounds of sweet potatoes? 225. And 225 pounds did not make a year for us. You would think that it would, but by the time we can sweet potatoes, by the time we uh, bake sweet potatoes, by the time we make sweet potatoes pies, by the time we make sweet potato this, sweet potato that, once you get sweet potatoes and learn how to use them for a lot of different things, then you realize uh, they're not going to last as long as you think they do. The problem is about, what, um, out of seven days, we probably eat sweet potatoes five days a week. We probably eat five, yeah, sweet potatoes five days out of seven days a week. Just simply because of their nutritional value. They're just a good, healthy thing to eat. And because on a homestead, it's one of the things that we can raise that's easy to store. Because if you have any kind of a storage facility whatsoever, sweet potatoes will keep all year long. Even in our hot climate. Even in our hot climate. Even though I have an underground root cellar that's deep under the ground, people go, oh, well, this is about 50 degrees in there. But no, when you live in the deep south like I do, my cellar is deep underground in the summertime because you have to have fresh air in it. And the temperature, the ambient temperature outside is 100 degrees with a 98% relative humidity. And you're pulling air into that cellar so that you keep a fresh air supply in it. The ambient temperature from outside overrides the ground temperature. And the temperature of my cellar was still about 75 to 80 degrees during the summer. And that's deep underground. Now you would think that the ground temperature would overcome it, but, but it doesn't. And therefore, when you put things like regular Irish potatoes in there, we can't keep a lot of things down in our cellar during the summertime simply because of the heat. Irish potatoes, even though they're in total pitch darkness, they begin to sprout even though they're in pitch dark. Now, the sweet potatoes will last all year and not <laughs> sprout down there because it's the right humidity and it's the right temperature. Now, when you dig your sweet potatoes, you can eat them straight as soon as you dig them, but you don't want to do that. Sweet potatoes need to be cured. They need to take about two weeks to cure, sitting out in partial sun, underneath the shade or something like that, so that you're able to, those shoot sweet, sweet potatoes, the, it, it, gives a, it gives a potato time for the sugars to acclimate in it and the tars and everything to relax. I mean, and, and one of the things about sweet potatoes is, is there's lots of different varieties of sweet potatoes. There's white ones, there's purple ones, there's red ones. And I'll be honest with you, it's all about your preference. It's all about what you like in a sweet potato when you eat it. Now, me personally, I like the white ones. The white ones are pretty good for baking. And now the red ones, the red ones are my favorite. Because, and if you go back here at my table right now, I've got sweet potatoes back there right now that I eat simply because I take them with me everywhere I go. If you go back to my hotel room, there are sweet potatoes in the refrigerator that's already been baked, still in their skins, sitting there, and all I'll do is just pull that skin apart on it, and I'll sit there and eat that sweet potato as a snack. Sweet potatoes are my snacks. 
So I'm not going to go too long with this one on sweet potatoes. There's only so much you can say about a potato. You know what I mean? You have to realize. It's, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I want to give, how much time do I have? But Patera wanted to get back on track. 20 minutes. i got 20 minutes. Okay. Okay, you're going to show some of the potatoes there? Okay. Question. I'll, I'll take a couple of questions if somebody has one. Okay, let me get back to my camera. Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. I want to know what is a, you know, I've forgotten what it was, a mole cricket? Oh, a mole cricket? It's a mole cricket. A mole cricket is, a, is an evil creature. Is what it is. <laughs> It's, uh, it's, a little, it's a little insect about this long. It can fly. It does have wings like a cricket, uh -huh. but its front feet resemble a crawfish. If any of you know what a crayfish is or a crawfish. Uh, like an earwig? Uh, well, yes. Kind of, have wings. It's kind of it's got the little claws on the yeah. front, and it's got jagged edges just like a crab. Yeah, yeah. It's got little feet just like that. And they'll get in your garden, and they mold. They just go through the garden, just leaving tunnels everywhere, and they eat the roots off a of plant. So they'll actually get up on the side of your plant and eat the sides of the plant off, and you'll go out there the next morning, and your plant just be dead. <laughs> After you've spent so much time like raising a tomato plant or green beans or anything like that, they love to feed on the roots and the sides of those stalks. We don't have them where I live. Thank goodness. Thank you. You're blessed. <laughs> uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, if you don't plant them at least, or you want to break the ground at least 12 inches deep, and you want to try to get the slip stuck as deep in that as you can get it, with, and leave some of the leaves above the ground, because what happens is if you don't do that as the potatoes grow, if the ground's not soft, the potato will come to a point, it's just like a tree root, it'll come to a, like a, a, a bedrock pan, and the potato, rather than growing down, will begin to grow upward, and it will stick out of the ground, and the sun begin to bleach it. And it makes it a lot more easier for birds, insects, rats, what all that to find it to get to. Well, I don't know if a mole could be switched there. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Now, this may shock you, but um, I live in a very nice Victorian home, okay? My dining room is an octagon-shaped dining room with some very elaborate. But he gets tarpaulins put on the floor during the summertime, and my sweet potatoes come in the house. <laughs> you know, because I, I treasure my sweet potatoes that much, and, and my house is a tool. Now, I don't abuse my home. But I do take care of the floors and stuff like that, and, and I do bring my potatoes, I bring a lot of my tomatoes, my vegetables, in to be curing, um, like our spaghetti squash, different things like this, I will bring inside, and I put them in the house just simply because we don't, occasionally we have to turn the AC on in the south, I think that's probably shocking, but we do have to, you know, and when you do that, the dry air that the air conditioning creates does help dry the potato out a lot faster, so it doesn't quite take two weeks to be able to um, cure them. We can probably do it a week inside the house. No, it's um, it's one of those things that uh, it's just a time thing. You know, I, I always tell people two weeks because two weeks is probably the best time period that I've figured out over the years of me doing it. Now, is it an exact art? I would not go that far as to say it's an exact art because I will, and when I say curing for two weeks, let me, let me clarify that. You can eat them at any time, but if you're looking for the sweet potato that's extremely mellow and it's got a really good taste to it, the longer you let it cure, the better it will be. I just say two weeks because I found that if I do it before two weeks, it doesn't seem to be as nice as it is after two weeks. Do not wash them until you get ready to eat them. Yes. Yeah. This lady had. So you cure them before you store them in the cellar? Yes. And then, how do you store them in the cellar? In, a, in, a, in sawdust or just? Um, you can put them in sawdust in the cellar, uh, or you can put them in pine straw or something like that. But I have these uh, these wooden crates that I built myself that stack on top of one another. 
and I'll just start in the bottom and I'll put a layer of uh, sawdust or straw or whatever in the bottom of mine. And then I put the sweet potatoes in. I put, them, I put one layer of sweet potatoes. I put more pine straw or sawdust. I put more sweet potatoes. And I just keep doing that until I get a box full. And I set a button on top of it. And then another. And I just keep doing it until I get it through that way. Um, somebody back to Yes, ma'am. If the ground is soft enough, because if you use like rotted sawdust or sand, you just kind of take your finger and kind of run it around the plant a little bit, get your fingers kind of deep in the ground, and when you pull it, it will just come loose from the potato. The slip will just break a loose from the potato. Do not dig the potato up because it will continue to produce slips. Yeah, just because it produces a few and you pull them off, in a week there will be more. Out of, out of about six to eight the sweet potatoes that we put in the ground, sometimes we'll get 200 slips off of them. Because they'll just keep producing as long as you don't break them off or pull a dig the potato up. I've got somebody way back there. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. No, you do not have to do that. I, 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 even with regular Irish potatoes, I only do that one time with regular Irish potatoes because to me it's a myth that, because see, once an Irish potato, and I, I'm going to get off my subject, but once an Irish potato breaks through the ground and begins to grow, it'll never form a potato above that. If you're going to actually keep piling dirt up on an Irish potato, as soon as it, you see the ground cracking to come up, you better be putting dirt on it at that point because if you don't and it ever starts that green part coming up out of the ground, it won't make a potato after that. Had her hand raised. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> My eyes are all back right here. Yeah. Yes. What about the, the spacing? How, how far apart do you plan on? I put my sweet potato rolls three feet apart. As a matter. What about in the row? How far apart? In three feet apart in the row. Okay. My rows are three feet apart. With my sweet potato slips three feet apart. And what I always tell people is, if you're going to make a stick. Like to push them in the ground, you're going to cut one off in the wood. If you'll make that stick three feet long, because it'll be right here, right beside you, right here. And if you need to know how long, you can just kind of judge it from the width and the length of the stick. Is sweet potato something that you would say would be good to grow in like raised beds or in Area. Yes, sweet potatoes, the question she's asking is, could sweet potatoes be grown in raised beds or in containers or anything to this nature? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, they do extremely well in raised beds. They do extremely well in uh, containers. Uh, especially if you live in a northern <laughs> climate, you can take a black, like a cattle feeder barrel or something like that, where the, the sun hits it and actually heats the dirt up. If you put them inside that, you can get some plastic around them or something over the frost or something can't get to them. You get a little bit earlier start on them because it heats the ground up a lot faster. And I'm sorry for that. I didn't see your arm. I'm out here looking at this, Derek. Yes, ma'am. No. You have to take them up because once they mature, if it ever starts raining or anything like that, they will actually rot in the ground. Now there are times when some of them will actually overwinter if you miss one. Or like me, if I, if I plow mine and a plow happens to break a piece off one of them off, the next year I will see a sprout in the garden because a piece of the potato remained in the soil and it didn't make it over winter. But if the, if the ground ever freezes with the potato in it, and this is something else I might want to bring out, is you want to make sure you harvest your sweet potatoes before it freezes. Because if you don't, the vine will actually sour, and, the, and the, it will actually sour your sweet potatoes down in the ground. It's just that I'm sitting up here, I've got like 10,000 things running through my mind, and I'm trying to remember all of them. <laughs> yes, ma'am. We planted a bunch of sweet potatoes last year, and we got a really good harvest. But now I'm wondering if maybe it was too wet when we harvested because they all made it. They didn't, they didn't seep, and they got all, all weird. That's probably due to the humidity of the area where you have them. Because sweet potatoes like a dry area. Like once, when you first set sweet potatoes out, they need water for the first, like first two or three weeks. You need to keep them watered good, and then after that, they kind of need a little bit of dryness. 
and if you've got a good bull cross with that is in the ground and it goes to raining, they will actually sprout in the ground while they're growing and start putting on sprouts. So it's kind of an art. you kind of got to learn uh, about what time to, and if you do dig them up and it does stay too damp where you put them at, in a, like a high humidity area, uh, there is a probability of them holding. And my time. Yeah, 10 minutes. Okay. I got, she says I've got 10 minutes because I want to get back on her schedule. Can I take the TV? Yep. Yes. So I need y'all talk. talk. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Any corners on the next year's your next year's still growing? Does it matter? Well, I think, um, well, I think I mentioned that I would not pick a real big potato to grow slips from because. It's just, a, it's just a waste of potato to me. No, I, I, I always prefer the longer ones. The longer the, the sweet potato and the, and the smaller in diameter, like little long slender ones, some of them may not be no bigger than my thumb. But if they're long, those are the ones I choose. Or I will also choose, if I get one that's not maybe this long and it's more round than it is anything else, I will use those also. Because mainly for her purposes, because... <laughs> When she's starting to can and stuff like that, those little small ones are just big. They can be canned when you take the skin off of them, but it just makes them a little bit more aggravating to fool with. You know, and, and I just I just regret to say when you're doing slips. I don't want to waste my big pretty ones to grow a slip on because it can be done from the small ones just as well. Okay, I'm right. Anybody else have a question before I finish? Yes, ma'am. It's a time thing. Whenever you plant your sweet potato, when you want to figure the variety that you're going to plant, look at the harvest days on it, and just make a journal of the day that you plant them. And then when it gets to be that time, it doesn't you do not have to dig them on that day. You know, if it's 90 days, you don't have to dig them on day 90. I mean, you can go to day 100 or day 110. Just know that. Watch the weather during that time and know that at day 90 they really should be mature if they're in the right right ground. There's another thing I might mention while things are still going on in my head here is when you plant sweet potatoes, do not put too much nitrogen into the soil. Because if you put too much nitrogen into the soil, you'll end up with all vines and your, your, your potatoes still won't be very big. Just don't overdo it because sweet potatoes are not heavy nitrogen to use. They're kind of like a, to not a tomato, but a, um, a potato plant or something like that. They're just, they love nitrogen, but you don't want to overdo it. Even though tomatoes love nitrogen, if you give a tomato plant too much nitrogen, you end up with all bush and no tomatoes on it. So it's, it's kind of a balance that you have to go through there. Okay, I'm running, my time's running short. I want to get back on Patera's time. Um, yeah. Okay, is there any more questions before I stop? Okay. Has it been self-explanatory? Have I have I covered all the bases? Okay. All right. Yes, I want to take just a couple of minutes here, and I want to thank Patera for giving us the opportunity to come up here, uh, all the way from the deep south where we live at, to uh, actually speak to y'all. And I want to thank y'all. I don't know how many, I use that word y'all, Julian don't like that. Right? Um, y'all make us possible. You know, and, and I appreciate that. I don't know how many of y'all are subscribed to us at Deep South Homestead, you know. <laughs> I see a lot of people hands one of them. Thank y'all so very much because it means a ton to Wanda and I to be able to share our life with y'all. Because We've made a lot of mistakes in life. And our journey through this whole thing is to not have you make the same mistakes that we made. If we can if we can put out a YouTube video and show you how to do something, and understand this, just because we do it a certain way does not mean that it's going to work like that for you. Do what we do. Just glean from what you see. Take some of the techniques. See if it'll work in your area. If it does, and it saves you some time, and it helps you to get through your homestead a lot quicker, because look, even me today, I don't know everything. 
you know, even though I've taught survival, I've been through some of the worst cases that, that life has to offer a person. I've, I mean, I've, you know, through dead people dying in my arms to everything in this world. I mean, there's nothing that you can't accomplish. And just because you don't have, I mean, this would be like a, something I want to say, have hope. Because hope is what you need on a homestead. Just like Story was talking about a while ago, I wanted to just jump up and shout because, you know, it's we can get discouraged on a homestead. You go out there and you work your tail off, and this happens to one and I all the time. You go out there and you work your tail off trying to get something up, and that happened to our English peas this year. We planted them things, and I mean, we was right on schedule. I was watching the moon, I was watching the almanac, and all this stuff, and I put them things in the ground. And I mean, they were coming up there, they got up here like this tall, and I walked out there one day and I told her, I said, that first row of English peas just don't look right. The others, the others were done getting up as high as this table here, and we had something like this tall. And I walked out there and looked, and there was rabbit tracks all up and down through the guard. You know, and I told her, I said, I said, do we start over, or what do we do? And I told her, I said, you know what, we're going to let nature take its course. We put an electric fence up around the garden to keep the rabbit out. Well, I couldn't find him to shoot him. That's the honest reason. I'll be honest with y'all. <laughs> yeah, and because that's usually what happens. <laughs> and because I could not catch this little critter, we put the electric fence up, and you know how God worked? Well, that rabbit ate all of those English peas off. They actually sprouted three or four sprouts back up in place of it. And it actually gave Danny an idea that sometimes you might want to prune them next to the ground sometimes <laughs> because we actually ended up with more English peas than we would have had if we just let them all grow naturally. And where I was fixing to become angry at, God actually turned it into a blessing. You know, so, so there can be hope on a homestead. Don't get frustrated. Even if you're in a, an apartment or if you live in a suburban type area and you got a little tiny backyard or whatever, do not give up because I'm telling y'all, it's not the end of the world. Anybody who knows anything about Scripture knows that there's a, there, there's a tribulation period, there's a thousand year millennial time after that, and I'm not going to get into the religious thing here, but you know it's not the end of the world, so that's why I don't use end of the world. I will use a phrase called life-changing events. A life-changing event can be anything from a hurricane, a tornado, uh, your health, um, a vehicle breaking down, I mean, it can be anything. You can lose an animal on the homestead. These are all life-changing events, and they will affect you on your homestead. They will affect the success of your homestead. You can have a beautiful garden. You can be like, um, who was it, Doug and Stacy that had the hailstorm come through? Just decimated what they had. What do you do? Do you throw your hands up in the air and say, oh my God, I'm never doing this again? No. You go back out, you pick your feet up, and you start over. You persevere, because I'm going to tell you, a lot of people look at us and go, you make homesteading look so easy. We get that all the time. It is work. You know, there is a lot of editing that goes on behind those clips. What makes you look good? She makes me look good. The phrase behind every good man is a good woman. There's one sitting right there. <laughs> because there's so many times we get in the house and we look at all of our footage and I go, oh my God, that just looks horrible. <laughs> you know, I thought I'm not putting this out here for people to look at. And she'll look at me and she'll go, Danny, they got to know the bad side as well as the good side. Everything can't be perfect because I'm OCD. And the reason I built million dollar homes was because I'm so OCD. Whenever I get ready to do something, if it's not perfect, I don't do it. And she has to keep me in kelter and make me realize that people need to see that everything's not perfect all the time. They have to understand that there's hardships, there's, there's heartaches, there's failures, and there's successes on a homestead. So homesteading is a very difficult thing. And I don't want to discourage you now, but you have to understand you're not going to always be successful in homesteading. But it's always a lesson. It's always a lesson to be learned. So, y'all, I want to get back on her time because, I mean, there's people coming up behind me, and I want to thank y'all for giving me your attention and allowing me to come today. Uh, 
Thank you for subscribing to Deep South Homestead, and if you're not, please do.